Thomas Jefferson left a tremendous impact upon the United States. His Democratic Republicans essentially demolished and replaced the Federalist foundations established by Washington and the Continental Congress before him. But Jefferson's vision soon schismed along economic, ethnic, and environmental lines. Whereas the agricultural Scotch-Irish South prioritized Jefferson's teachings of agrarian democracy, so did the Anglo-German Industrial North embrace Jefferson's belief in egalitarian republicanism, to the point that even their foundational mythos began to diverge. In the North, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, in particular the phrase, all men are created equal, became a greater beacon to rally around than the Constitution itself, the document which actually gave political shape to the country. This created debate over whether the United States truly began in 1789 when the Constitution officially came into effect and Washington assumed the presidency, or in 1776 when the US declared its independence, the two documents becoming rival totems which no longer signified unity, but the northern and southern visions of what the nation truly was. This debate went even further, arguing over which original colonial settlement was truly responsible for creating the United States, the southern settlement of Jamestown in Virginia or the northern settlement of Plymouth Bay in Massachusetts. The former held claim to the first instance of democracy in the future country, while the latter boasted divine virtue arriving in the new world to worship God, unlike the southern colonists who arrived as profiteers and introduced slavery into the would-be country. As the Deep South rallied behind the Democrat Party for its pro-state, pro-agrarian platform, so did many in the North then without a party seek to establish a faction which more expressly represented their historic and present demands. The direction of a strong and unifying central government as promoted by the Federalists, one which could take action to promote a uniform religious morality at the national level. Greater equality across the races and genders as had been interpreted from Jefferson's Democratic Republicans and a pro-industry and infrastructure platform that complemented their particular economy, as had been favored by the Whigs. Many had initially placed their faith in the aforementioned Whigs, but as we've already gone over in part 2, that party proved too moderate, too opposed to geographic sectionalism, and too internally divided to achieve real change. Though in all fairness, both parties of the time had become more divided than their Federalist and Democratic Republican predecessors. Martin Van Buren's earlier breakaway from the Democratic Party had seen the creation of the Free Soil Party, but its platform largely revolved around the single issue of preventing the expansion of slavery, and thus was doomed to a small following. The collapse of the Whigs just prior to Buchanan's election allowed much of its remnants and those of these smaller parties to be absorbed by the emerging northern-focused Republican Party. With its rise, Jefferson's Democratic-Republican foundation had finally broken into the Democrats of the South and the Republicans of the North. The Republicans did not shy away from sectionalism. They recognized that the Democrats had shown where they stood and who they preferred, whether intentional or not, they were the party of the South, just as the Republicans must act as the party of the North and of freedom over slavery. There now stood, including California and Oregon, 18 free states against 15 slave states, with the free states alone carrying a winning number of electoral votes. There was no longer any need to pander to the slaveholders, no need to pander to agrarianism or to states' rights. The Republicans represented the institutions of the North and its long-term vision for America. Free markets, free reign to expand national infrastructure, free western land for those who could settle it, and freedom from the shackles of southern servitude. For the first time since the rise of Jefferson, power had dramatically shifted from the central and southern states back to the north where it was expected to remain, and for many in the south that proved an intolerable reality straight on the horizon. The Republican Party's first attempt at the presidency would prove a failure, as candidate John C. Fremont carried an unreliable reputation, and was even seen by some in the north as a radical. Though that being said, he still received a fair deal of support, reassuring the Republicans that they could win the following election if they chose their candidate wisely. That candidate ultimately being former Whig and increasingly popular orator, Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln grew up very modestly in a log cabin which sat upon some farmland tended to by himself and his family, simple folks who typically got by on the bare minimum and saw greener pastures both in regard to work and in the literal sense, moving to Indiana from Abraham's native Kentucky after having lost a great deal of their land in a legal dispute, which the Lincoln family couldn't afford to contest. Just two years after the move at age nine, Lincoln would lose his mother, only for his father to remarry soon after, adding four more people to their small household as this new wife had brought over her children from a previous marriage. Eventually, the greatest burden of work would be placed upon young Abraham's shoulders as his father's poor health left him less capable of completing his typical work, leaving Abe to work tirelessly upon his own farm and the farms of others just to make ends meet. The young Lincoln soon came to resent his father and dreamed of escaping to a more respectable life and profession, for unlike his simple parents who could not afford to even consider education, Lincoln knew deep inside that he was capable of far more than laboring in the dirt from sunrise to sunset, and he hungered for knowledge that could help him better his place in the world, spending his few moments of free time to read and write, sometimes even shirking his chores to do so. 
something his father, who some have claimed was illiterate, would punish him for. Abraham would ultimately leave that life behind him and never look back, it being said that he only spoke to his father once more from the day he left to the day that his father died, Abraham neither inviting his father to his marriage ceremony, nor visiting him on his deathbed. We might assume that this laborious upbringing and sense of needing to escape the simple life imposed upon him by his father made Abraham sympathetic to the slaves of the South, believing that they too deserved an opportunity to thrive on their own and never look back on the difficulties of their past lives. Abraham would begin anew in a small community in Illinois, and it was here that he began making money for himself and emerge as a pillar of the community. So respected did he become that he was encouraged to run for public office, and though this initial attempt had fallen flat, he aggressively took to studying politics and public speaking in between jobs, throwing his hat into the ring for a second time just two years later and emerging victorious. Despite barely having any formal education, he'd very effectively teach himself law and not long after acquire his license to practice, further developing through this occupation a strong sense of justice and the ability to mediate. He'd become both a prominent lawyer and statesman, joining the Whig party and becoming deeply fascinated with the teachings of Henry Clay, adopting many of his political beliefs including protectionist and pro-industrial economics as well as government investment in national infrastructure. He'd briefly shelve his political career after being offered an unglamorous promotion by Zachary Taylor, but would observe the escalating national tensions of the period from the sidelines before ultimately returning as one of the loudest voices against disunion. By that point, his old party had fallen into ruin, and he was immediately sought out by the Republicans for his powerful speeches and widespread appeal as a former Whig, moderate, a self-made man, both strong and intelligent, and an expressed believer in the containment of slavery. He'd become the Republican candidate of the 1960 presidential election, and with every free state coming together behind the Republican Party, while the Democrats fractured along Northern, Southern, and Union lines, his victory was virtually assured, but for the Deep South, this outcome was unacceptable. Lincoln had publicly promised that he held no intention of outlawing slavery in the states where it presently existed. That was beyond his jurisdiction as president. He only sought to prevent its spread to additional territories and ensure that the nation moving forward was on a course toward greater freedom. But after years of what felt like betrayal from the federal government, Democrat and Whig alike, after years of Northerners trampling upon laws the South repeatedly compromised for, and after years of being told now by the faction in control of the nation that they were sinful heretics, simply evil for doing what they had been legally doing since the country was founded, well, the South simply had enough. In their eyes, the North had repeatedly expressed its desire to disenfranchise the slave-owning South, and now with Kansas and Nebraska soon to become two more free states, along with the Southwest, that disenfranchisement had been achieved. A century of existing conjoined to the dominantly Anglo and German American North demonstrated how incompatible their value systems were. Jefferson had promised them, the farming class, that they were the nation's future, not the urban elites and religious Puritans who believed they understood freedom best. The South rose to national prominence and remained there after thoroughly defeating the elite North Anglo Federalists, and in that time their own values flourished only stumbling whenever Northerners attempted to represent them, or when they compromised with the belief that their opponents would keep their word. Refusing to continue this partnership with those whose views had become irreconcilable with their own, the South moved to secede, beginning with the state that challenged fellow Southerner and Democrat Andrew Jackson all those years ago, South Carolina. For Lincoln, and as we mentioned in Part 2, for the majority of the country, the preservation of the Union was far more important than the question of slavery, and so several attempts were made to reach a new compromise which might revoke the secession or at least encourage additional states considering secession to remain within the Union. Lincoln offered forgiveness and protection to the seceded states, ensuring them that he would enforce the Fugitive Slave Act and further enshrine constitutional protections for slavery where it presently existed. But remembering how poorly compromise had worked for them in the past, the South rejected the offer and secession continued, giving rise to the Confederate States of America. Lincoln warned that he would protect all federal assets within claimed Confederate lands, such as that which ultimately initiated the Civil War, Fort Sumter. The fort was situated in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, and while not a tremendous threat to the city itself, could have been used to attack shipments to and from the city. More than that, it stood as a challenge to the Confederacy's ability to enforce its sovereignty from the United States. It was, however, running low on supplies, and abandoning the fort to the Confederates became a serious consideration. Despite discussions between South Carolina, the fort, and the Union, which hinted at the possibility of a peaceful surrender of the fort or a resupplying mission, the decision was made by the Confederacy to attack Fort Sumter and seize it by force, giving Lincoln the necessary justification to initiate military action against the rebel South. The Civil War would last four years and consume the majority of Lincoln's first presidential term, bleeding into his re-election, 
He'd attempt to prevent additional states from seceding, finding success with Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, but the act of declaring war upon several southern states brought Arkansas and Virginia to secede as well, who in turn contributed to the secession of North Carolina and Tennessee. The loss of Virginia had cost Lincoln the support of Colonel Robert E. Lee, whom Lincoln had intended on promoting to Major General and hoped that he would lead Union forces to a speedy victory as General Winfield Scott's successor. Without Colonel, later General Robert E. Lee, Lincoln went through a handful of military commanders, none of whom proved both effective and cooperative. Despite the Union's superior numbers and resources, breaking the Confederate line proved incredibly difficult. That is, until General Lee's plans were leaked to the Union, allowing for the tides to finally be turned. Command would eventually fall to General Ulysses S. Grant, a more ruthless military commander who unleashed heavy destruction upon the South in order to deprive them of any resource and asset they might exploit, even at heavy expense to his own men. Lincoln has been criticized for having appointed Grant to his position of power despite his actions, however by this point Lincoln was becoming incredibly desperate for an end to the conflict. He'd heard tell of so much bloodshed that he began to question why if God intended for this war to have a victor, did he not simply decide and end it already. On a similar note, Grant saw the Civil War as divine retribution against the United States and the South especially for having declared war upon Mexico in what he believed was solely the pursuit of expanding slavery. This in turn allowed him to feel justified in the harsh actions he took against the enemy. Lincoln saw on the horizon if the previous pace was to continue an endless war of attrition for the essential reconquest of the South. Even once the fighting officially ceased, he did not expect the Southerners to forgive this attack against them, and surely, if not sooner than later, they would rebel once again if they possessed the means to do so. Lincoln's decision then was to inflict a devastating blow upon the South, but then take personal responsibility for their recovery. A disciplinary action to remind them of Union strength, followed by an apologetic embrace reminding them that they are still family. Grant would ultimately defeat Lee, and while Lee's men insisted he continue fighting, the Confederate general refused to allow further destruction to befall his fellow men, his home state of Virginia, and the rest of his country, North and South alike. General Lee's surrender would essentially end the conflict as his had been the primary theater of the war. Lincoln, who had just earlier won re-election, the first president to do so since Andrew Jackson over three decades prior, was optimistic. Having not only had the opportunity to end the war before his presidency concluded, he now had the ability to carefully walk it back to recovery. As calls from his party grew and the war's end created a unique opportunity to end what had been the most divisive policy in the country, Lincoln, no longer feeling bound by his pre-war promise of the South, abolished slavery across the country via the 13th Amendment. Acceptance of slavery's abolition, along with a pledge of loyalty from 10% of each southern state's population, became the criteria under Lincoln for reintegration of the individual Confederate states into the Union. Post-war, the southern states were placed under military rule, but reintegration would restore typical government operations. Lincoln had a direct hand in rebuilding the governments of Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee, each of which proved highly successful and satisfactory to a majority of those states' populations. Former Confederates, save for their upper leadership, would be granted total amnesty and have their political rights restored upon their oath of loyalty to the Union. This outcome proved too liberal for the radical faction of the Republican Party, a small but influential lot who repeatedly opposed Lincoln for his moderate Whig background and demanded greater privileges and securities for the freed black population, along with harsher punishment for the South. The radicals of Congress, led by Thaddeus Stevens in the House and Charles Sumner in the Senate, had existed in a power struggle with Lincoln coming to recognize the executive office as a hindrance to their agenda, repeatedly seeking to undermine executive and even judicial authority through the establishment of independent government institutions such as the Joint Committee on the Conduct of War, utilizing the committee to discredit or remove any military officer suspected of holding Confederate sympathies, a label which was attributed for as little as calling for a tactical regrouping, retreat, or essentially anything which wasn't a reckless grand-style head-on charge at the enemy. The result was a replacement of skilled West Point officers with inexperienced, politically driven, or naive officers, which, as you might imagine, led to greater casualties on the Union side. The Radicals attempted to interfere with all aspects of the conflict, especially post-war Reconstruction. They exemplified the northern extremes of the North-South cultural divide in their view that there was no Union, there was only the moral, industrious Free North and the exploitative, backward Slave South. Two entities tragically bound together, one of which was dragging the other down. The Radicals saw the South as a lesser entity, something to be conquered, colonized, and utterly reorganized at the social, economic, and political level. Stevens, and to a lesser extent Sumner, believed that statehood should be stripped away from the southern states, their citizens, save for the freemen, deprived of their constitutional rights and ability to vote, while new northern settlers prepared the southern territories to be reintegrated as states with new populations more receptive to northern ideals. Lincoln disagreed. 
He didn't believe the Southerners deserved such conditions, nor that they would tolerate them, that such measures would only give legitimacy to Southern desires for independence from a government which sought to subjugate and erase them. Lincoln's primary concern and objective in the build-up to, during, and following the Civil War was to ensure the survival of the Union. That meant forgiving the South and rebuilding national brotherhood now that the bitter subject of slavery was done away with. This demanded a process of reconciliation, rehabilitation, and reunification, not punishment and domination as the radicals desired. And though slavery as an issue was resolved, still remained the divisive question of the freedman's role in America. He was now free to live as his own master, but could he do so in the same nation which had once held him in servitude? And was he to be an equal citizen or relegated to a second-class role? Should it be left up to the individual states to decide? Would this be the beginning of a new national debate that ultimately ends in sectional violence once again? Lincoln himself was concerned that the freed population would not only inflame and become victim to severe discrimination, but that they would, with their limited skill sets, slave upbringing, and historic tension with the white south, ultimately have negative effects upon the national economy and national sense of unity. Following in the footsteps of his role model, Whig leader and former president of the American Colonization Society, Henry Clay, Lincoln determined, as most moderates in the antebellum period had, that the most moral and effective solution would be to establish a colony exclusively for the free population in which they would be beyond the threat of racial persecution and free to pursue a national agenda in their own best interest, much as Jackson had arranged for the natives during the Indian removal. Lincoln had ordered investigations into various colonial prospects across Central America, South America, Africa, and the Caribbean, but several issues stood in the way, notably the ongoing war. Although it's been suggested by some that Lincoln was eventually talked out of colonization by abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who insisted that the freedmen should remain in America, this theory depends almost entirely upon Lincoln not having publicly written of any new colonization plans following that meeting with Douglass late into his first term. Despite the fact that around the beginning of his second term, Lincoln had once again opened up discussions of colonization with multiple members of his inner circle, suggesting that the gap of discussion on the subject was merely to avoid any divisive talk in the build-up to the critical 1864 election. The radicals were infuriated with these proposals, but most moderates and of course the Democrats threw their support behind Lincoln. After years of destructive war, the North and South needed peace, not further conflict. All the while, many Northerners remained hesitant to simply allow the majority of newly freed slaves to remain in the South where they might incite racial hostility or become victim to it themselves. Worse yet, if they were to migrate en masse to the North where they would either put out of work low-skilled laborers or become a public expense by not being able to find work. Lincoln put these concerns to rest, and nearly all but the extremes of both parties appeared satisfied. Tragically, before Lincoln could set these resolutions in motion, he'd be assassinated by one of these very radicals. Not a Republican, however, but a Confederate sympathizer named John Wilkes Booth. Shattering the country's last best chance for reconciliation, and bringing an end to the age of Lincoln before it had even begun. Abraham Lincoln never truly had the privilege of serving as a peacetime president, nor did he have the opportunity to shape a political era of his own. He was a vestige of the dead Whig Party, the last and greatest of that faction to ever serve as president, though he did so as a Republican. The Republicans who, upon his untimely death, betrayed his legacy to seize power for themselves. With Lincoln gone, the moderates hoped his vice president, Andrew Johnson, would prove a respectable replacement, and though he aimed to fulfill the wishes of his predecessor, he lacked the finesse and admirable authority which Lincoln carried. During Johnson's speech campaign meant to drum up support for fellow Democrats and moderates in the midterm elections, he proceeded to tarnish what reputation he had by falling into the traps of Republican hecklers, making of himself a laughingstock and tilting public support in the opposite direction. The radicals would win major gains in the election, and the Republicans would now hold a two-thirds majority in both houses, enough to override Johnson's vetoes and carry forward their Reconstruction agenda unhindered. The president was left essentially powerless. Congress made clear that as executive, his one authority was simply to execute the legislation they brought before him, and if he didn't, they'd still proceed regardless. The South, previously placed under the authority of governors appointed by the president, was now placed by Congress back under military rule following fears that under current conditions, traditional Southern politicians might return to power and seek to restore slavery or reignite rebellion. The states were divided into five military districts, each led by a general who was subject to the authority of radical Republican loyalist Ulysses S. Grant. And through the use of the military, the black population would not only be free, but given the right to vote, at a time when many whites had been politically disenfranchised for participating in the Civil War. This apparent fixing of the South's elections left many to consider the newly elected governments illegitimate. The Radical Republicans saw this as a necessary measure to prevent a Southern resurgence, but this only inspired greater resistance to the heavily one-sided and at times incompetent government, one which drew in new opportunistic arrivals from the North, seeking to northernize the South and make a profit off the cheap war-torn land. 
The oppressive military presence, exploitation of southern land by northern elites, and manipulated election results ultimately spawned a hostile reaction from the south in the form of terror and insurgency groups like the Ku Klux Klan, who saw themselves as freedom fighters in the war against an occupying enemy, pulling the post-war north-south divide ever wider, just as Lincoln had feared. What many have called the nail in the coffin for presidential authority during this period was Congress's attempted and nearly successful removal of Johnson from office over a relatively minor issue which had only existed because Congress had successfully overridden one of Johnson's vetoes of a law meant to protect one of their allies. Essentially, Congress made a law because they expected Johnson to fire Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Johnson tried to have the law thrown out, Congress overrode the decision, Johnson proceeded anyway, and Congress came just one vote short of removing the president from office, only for the very same law to be deemed unconstitutional decades later. While Johnson survived this incident, he would not be re-elected, but instead see replacement by the Congressional Republicans' ideal figurehead, someone who would be a perfect face for the federal government without challenging the actions of Congress behind the scenes. The most popular man in the country at the time, but one utterly unfit to hold the office, General Ulysses S. Grant. The president under whom began the longest-lasting and most widespread epidemic of corruption in the country yet. In the eight-year span of Grant's presidency, Northern Industries and businesses developed close partnerships with Republican politicians. Politicians across both parties began making extensive use of backdoor deals for purposes of increasing their own personal wealth and power. Government secrets now had a price to any speculators interested in where the economy might move. The nation's monetary reserve was plundered, even in spite of the already terrible debt which had multiplied 40 times since the outbreak of the war. The South had become the playground of rich Northerners who could afford to buy it, while the freedmen's votes kept them in power for little more reason than party affiliation. And at the same time in the White House, several of Grant's inner circle, military friends, and family members whom he appointed to government positions became embroiled in their own corruption scandals, Grant actively protecting them when these scandals finally came to light. Many have called Grant a naive man, one whose honesty, trust, and lack of political knowledge were exploited by bad actors around him, and Grant himself had argued as much. However, Grant certainly wasn't so blind as to not realize how bad things had become. He had even openly expressed his desire to curtail corruption, but only made little success in doing so, and again protected his allies when they were ultimately exposed. When many of these individuals who profited off corrupt deals, sold sensitive information, pushed paid-for agendas, and attempted to cover it up were Grant's own friends and family, who, again, he appointed and actively protected from punishment, then there is good reason to be suspicious of Grant himself. Corruption aside for now, during the Civil War, many of the natives within the Indian Territory having been slaveholders themselves, allied with the Confederacy, and in doing so, Lincoln argued that they had nullified their protective treaties with the United States, which had been provided by Jackson. Lincoln had seemingly hoped to apply similar treatment to the tribes as had been applied to the South, amnesty in exchange for an oath of loyalty and abolition of slavery. However, under Grant and the Radical Congress, the lands of the five civilized tribes were significantly reduced to make way for additional Indian and non-Indian settlement as Western expansion continued eventually paving the way for the outright abolishment of the Indian Territory and establishment of the state of Oklahoma. The sovereign status of the natives as independent nations within the United States was suspended, ending the policy of negotiating with the natives via treaty, while the old policy of assimilation was once again adopted. New conflicts would break out between the United States and various native tribes across the West as a result of further encroachment and the perception of assimilation policy as an attempted destruction of native culture. Grant would readmit the remaining non-integrated states to the Union and restore voting rights to the majority of Southern whites during his third year in office. However, by this point, a new Republican establishment had become rooted in these states, though gradually it appeared it was being chipped away. The House of Representatives would return to Democrat control midway through Grant's second term, and begin an investigation into the administration's corruption, all the while pushing back against Northern influence in the South. Although all the former Confederate states had rejoined the Union, South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana remained under military occupation. A significant degree of fraud occurred within those three states during the subsequent presidential election of 1876, and a following dispute over who to award the contested votes to ultimately led to a compromise. Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes would receive the votes and become president. However, the federal military occupation of the South was to be ended, the southern states would be given full authority to govern its black population as it saw fit without federal interference, and a Southern Democrat was to serve in the new presidential cabinet. Two other conditions which would have strengthened the Southern economy were also proposed, but never fulfilled. With that, a new period in the Republican age began. The radicals had gradually died out, losing support from the moderates who had grown tired of the anti-Southern and pro-Freedman rhetoric, simply wishing to put the nation back on track. The South would retain control of the House of Representatives, but took to focusing on their local affairs, emerging from Reconstruction as a united voting bloc, the Solid South, and remaining as such for the following ten presidential elections. 
All the while, the largely Republican presidents gradually regained their lost executive authority and attempted to control the corruption that had become so widespread and now threatened to make of America a plutocracy, a shell of a republic covertly run by the nation's most wealthy. For three decades, politics would follow this trend, while socially the country was transforming. Although the North and South had remained culturally divided whilst harboring additional divides within their own regions as well, the nation was becoming increasingly strung closer together by an ever-expanding network of railroads available to even the common man. The Northerner could travel south or the Southerner to the north in just a matter of hours or days. Both could travel westward to the opposite coast in a fraction of the time it would have taken otherwise. Business was no longer being conducted on merely a state level, but now on a national scale. Urbanization was occurring at a rapid pace, cities now able to become ever larger as commuting times whether from within the city or from neighboring towns were made far more convenient. The train brought to prominence other major industries which employed many more low-skilled laborers. If you wanted to produce more trains and tracks, you would obviously need more steel, copper, lumber, and iron. You'll need fuel, like coal and oil, thus giving rise to the captains of industry. While some were less principled than others, and a great lot certainly used underhanded tactics, these men, for better or for worse, became major players on the national scale, impacting policy, influencing politicians, transforming the economy, and creating a new social order. Hay's successor, James Garfield, would proceed to tackle some of the corruption plaguing the nation before he was assassinated by a crazed aspiring politician. Garfield's successor, Chester A. Arthur, continued the crusade against corruption and cronyism, even despite having come into politics thanks to the patronage system. Seeing an increasing influx of Chinese immigrants since the first emergence of major settlements along the west coast, around the same time that the national population was rapidly rising and finding employment for freed blacks was still a major concern, Arthur would see to the suspension of Chinese immigration for a 10-year period while also barring from entry any immigrant who might become a public charge. Immigration from the majority of Asia would eventually be banned, and many Chinese Americans ultimately chose to return to China after feeling increasingly discriminated against, shrinking the population back to less than 0.1%. Arthur did not intensely pursue a second term on account of his failing health, and instead fellow Republican James Blaine was nominated. However, the Republicans stood divided. Following the fall of the Radicals, Republicanism found itself torn between two major issues, patronage or meritocracy. Should politicians be allowed to favor their loyalists and risk the creation of greater corruption, or should they act purely on the basis of merit and risk losing political influence? The severe scale of corruption occurring at the national level left many to favor the latter option, but Republican candidate Blaine carried a lot of controversial baggage, having been involved in a number of corruption scandals. Democrat candidate Cleveland, on the other hand, was widely known as a staunch opponent of corruption and promoted his honest character in the build-up to the election, very narrowly winning by less than a percentage point, and becoming the first Democrat to hold the office of presidency since James Buchanan. Cleveland would carry out the old state's rights tradition of the Democrat Party by reducing responsibilities taken up by the federal government and delegated them to these states and citizens, Seeing that federal authority, especially that of Congress, had been widely expanded since the Civil War and risked exceeding its constitutional scope if the American public grew more dependent upon Washington and in turn willingly surrendered more power to it. He'd also peel back the industrial protectionism first initiated late into the Buchanan administration. Cleveland's justification went back to the old agrarian Democrat support for low tariffs as well as his belief in free trade. Despite running for a second term, he was defeated by Republican Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of Whig President William Henry Harrison, the one who essentially served none of his term. Benjamin Harrison generally continued the policies of his Republican predecessors, restoring the protectionism curtailed under Cleveland, rooting out corruption in politics and picking up greater momentum for continued American expansion, something which largely faded away for a time but which was slowly being revived now that the policy held no obvious risk of tilting national power one way or the other. Harrison's protectionism, though rooted in good intentions, ultimately cost him re-election to Grover Cleveland, who won a non-consecutive second term, the first president to do so. All these administrations built up to significant returns come the presidency of William McKinley, who witnessed the beginning of America's emergence as not merely a powerful and united country, but the unchallenged leader of the Western Hemisphere. The previous few presidents had gradually been building up America's navy, which had been neglected and outdated in the years immediately following the Civil War. But now, thanks to the greater interconnectivity of the nation, rise of industrial labor, and a new bounty of manufactured materials to draw upon, stood as one of the most powerful navies on the planet. Economic prosperity was on the rise, but still corruption existed across the private sector, bleeding into political affairs. The later presidents of this era had done well to clean up much of the corruption originating within the government, but still it wasn't enough, as monopolistic companies held tremendous sway over individual politicians and kept themselves secure by playing to the political interests of the time. This created a rising divide within both parties, but in the Republican Party especially, of those who sought to represent the successful businessmen of America, the country's best and brightest, 
and those who sought to represent the common laboring man who had no voice but his vote. Despite McKinley's assertion that America must quote, avoid the temptations of territorial aggression, investigations were quietly being made into South America, Central America, and the Pacific, seeking out potential partners and strategic assets which might help the US secure its position in the Americas from the rising imperial powers of Germany and Japan. Hawaii had been a major consideration for both Cleveland and Harrison, recognizing its significant potential as an outpost from which to both guard the western coast and to project its influence into the Pacific through military and trade. McKinley would proceed to promptly annex the island chain. Panama was a chief territory of interest as well, particularly for the possible construction of a canal linking the Pacific to the Atlantic, allowing for speedy coast-to-coast -coast transport by not only rail but by ship. Construction of such a canal had been of major interest to Britain and the other European powers as well. As such, failure to secure a canal for the United States could see this crucial asset fall into potentially hostile hands. Finally came Cuba and Puerto Rico, long-held territorial ambitions of the US which could help secure American dominance of the lucrative Caribbean, opening up access to valuable sugar plantations and other tropical crops. It'd be here during the Spanish-American War that a titan of a politician would make a name for himself, personally volunteering his assembled regiment of men to fight and conquer for America he'd become McKinley's vice president come his second term, but the president would not live to see it very far. However, in death, McKinley would help trigger America's next great change.